Oh. Hello. Uh, thank you. I'm not actually going to try my English accent here. It's, uh, if you want to hear it, talk to me in person because it's a private matter. Um, but uh, I'm here to talk about pre-rendering strategies. You may also know pre-rendering as universal. I've been reluctant to call it universal because pre-rendering, I think, is a better term. Um, I'm going to share these slides later, so if there's something interesting, just wait and I'll tweet the link and you don't have to take pictures of anything. A uh, quick bit, uh, Ed already covered it, but I used to be on the Angular team. I, for the last year on the Angular team at Google, was the tech lead of the Angular mobile team. And we focused on a lot of things regarding progressive web apps, making those a great experience, and also making apps generally load fast. Uh, there, so a lot of Angular focuses on the runtime performance. We focused a lot on loading performance and how to uh, make the perceived performance better for all users. Part of that was universal and pre-rendering, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but now I'm co-founder of Narwhal. We're almost a year old at the company. Victor and I, Victor Savkin and I uh, started this last year. Uh, Victor, who's also a former member of the core team at Google. And uh, we've got a website and a blog at uh, blog.nrwl.io and Twitter. And everything we do is Angular related. So we've got a lot of deep Angular content on our blog. We've got some books we've written that go deep on a lot of Angular concepts that I would recommend checking out. And we recently released a open source toolkit on top of Angular and Angular CLI called NX that uh, makes it uh, adds a lot of conventions and uh, tools and libraries that make it easier to build uh, large applications with Angular that uh, I'd recommend checking out. So as of Angular 4, pre-rendering is a first-class part of Angular. So we have this new package called at Angular slash platform dash server that you may have seen before, you may have tried it, uh, and it brings with it a lot of benefits. So it's now being a first-class part of Angular. It's tested alongside the Angular framework as it develops. It's kept up to date with Angular. Uh, it's uh, got it's well reviewed internally at Google. It's gone through lots of audits and and um, validation of its design. So lots of great things about being first first class. So when I say pre-rendering, I'm talking about the ability for uh, you as a developer to generate HTML before it ever gets to the browser uh, that's fully rendered and represents your application and your application's components all rendered on the page with CSS and everything ready to go so users can see your page before Angular actually warms up inside the browser and bootstraps. So uh, on the left is what we see when something's pre-rendered opposed to on the right where we just see an empty page waiting for Angular to bootstrap and take over. Uh, sometimes it's asked, is, is this the same thing as AOT compilation? How is it different? Uh, the AOT compiler produces optimized JavaScript so that uh, your code can be smaller and faster, whereas pre-rendering actually generates an HTML document. So pre-rendering exists to satisfy these three priorities. We want apps to be fast loading. And more importantly, we want them to be perceived as fast because um, there are actually multiple phases or mul multiple steps in how an app is loaded and displayed to the user, we want to have more meaningful content earlier on. We want apps to be scrapable by social sharing scrapers. And we want them to be crawlable by search engine bots. So for fast loading, Angular's got some things built in that optimize it for quick download and bootstrap, like AOT, which should not be new to anybody by now because it's been around for a while. Build Optimizer, a rather new thing that makes tree shaking more powerful in Angular CLI and lazy loading so a developer can take control over when certain parts of their application get loaded. And the opportunity for improvement we want to seize with pre-rendering is this dead time between when your HTML is loaded and when your app is done bootstrapping in the browser. There are two metrics that we want to focus on when we talk about optimizing that time. The first one is the time to first meaningful paint. In other words, when the user can see content that is meaningful to me. And the second is time to interactive, or when I, as a user, can do something to the application and it will respond to me. So to give a little bit of a visual, without pre-rendering, your load may look like this, where your loading takes the time on the blue, and Bootstrap takes the time in the green. Uh, on the Bootstrap time, once the HTML document is loaded, if all I have is some text in there, for example, and I haven't actually pre-rendered my application, I may just see loading. And I'll see that up until the time that Angular is done bootstrapping and my application is interactive. But with pre-rendering, we can take somewhat the same graph but shift the time that the user can see content forward uh, by a significant amount of time because we can have content ready to look at while Angular then warms up in the browser, evaluates, finishes bootstrapping, and becomes fully interactive. 
So to make our application scrapable, we care about things like Facebook and Twitter. So if a user shares a link to my, my content on their Twitter feed, we want the metadata of my application, like the title, description, and content. Excuse me, I forgot to spit out my gum. Uh, uh, we want that to show up on their feed. So these scrapers prefer specific meta tags. Uh, a lot of them will look at the body to actually see the content of your page. And they want to see canonical URLs. So if your application or this page can be accessed from different URLs, they want to see the canonical URL. And that's like the correct single URL so that they don't duplicate uh, content. Now, these scrapers don't typically actually run your application and execute JavaScript and see what the final state of your JavaScript rendered application is. So uh, for example, if I wanted to share a blog article, I want it to look like this, where I've got the description, the title, everything like that, the, the image for the article show up correctly in my Twitter feed. And how these social networks make this possible is they have their own meta tags defined. So Facebook has the open graph protocol that they've kind of designed, and Twitter has their own card protocol. Uh, so for these, you, this is actually doesn't require a whole lot of pre-rendering to make right. And then we want our apps to be crawlable. Uh, we, when search engines crawl your applications, they want to see a title, they want to see a meta description, and also canonical URLs. Most importantly, they would look a lot more at page content. So they look at what's in the body of your page, what are users actually going to see. Uh, they want to know for certain that what they're crawling and what they're indexing is what you're actually showing to users. What's unique about these compared to social scrapers is they'll actually execute JavaScript, especially Googlebot has gotten a lot more advanced at this. So there are some limitations, like they run an older version of Chrome when they do it, so it doesn't have all the APIs. And there are lots of other nuances about how they um, crawl your, your web application. And they still recommend pre-rendering to make sure that if you care about search engines, like if search engine optimization is important to you, it's a good idea to pre-render just in case the Googlebot isn't able to fully render your JavaScript page. So those are the priorities. We want it to be fast. We want it to be scrapable. We want it to be crawlable. And before I start talking about how we can approach this, let's talk about the process of what it actually means to pre-render, what it looks like for you as a developer. There are basically four steps. You render something, you serve it, you bootstrap your application, and you can replay events. So for render, it's really this simple. Angular Platform Server provides this render module factory function to you that you pass it a um, module that you've already compiled and give it a little bit more information, like the URL you want to render. And then it spits out full string of HTML on the other side that you can do whatever you want with. Now, there are some misconceptions about pre-rendering. Probably the, the biggest one is that it must run on a server, like you can't do it at build time. Uh, or you must run it while the request is happening on a server. But this isn't true. As you saw, it's just a function that you call. So you could really, any place you can call this function, you can pre-render something. Um, another is that you must render the, the page exactly as it'll appear after Bootstrap, so that you have to render the full page and everything on the page, every component and that you have to apply the same strategy across your entire application, that if you're re rendering every route, every part of your application must be pre-rendered. Therefore, every route must support pre-rendering. Uh, so that's just a quick uh, overview of the render process. It's really simple. And then you have to serve your page. So a server gets a request for the page. Uh, you can either serve the pre-rendered page uh, for the route from your cache, or you could lazily pre-render the page for the route if it hasn't yet been pre-rendered. Or you could just serve an app shell, just like a shell of your application with a header and, and footer. Uh, these are just like a summary of things you could do. Uh, so serving is pretty simple. It's already been pre-rendered. You just have to get it the right thing. And then bootstrap. So when you load your page in the browser, the first thing that happens is the pre-rendered document is served in the browser. So the user sees your, your page with whatever content you've already served. And then Angular begins bootstrapping in the browser. So the scripts evaluate. Angular starts doing its thing. When it's done and it's ready to take over, the uh, pre-rendered document will be removed, and the new dynamically created Angular document will replace it. So that brings us to the last part of it, is what happens as, uh, in that in-between time as the user is viewing the application, and then Angular takes over. Well, there are some things we can do, like we can replay user events. So since the, the pre-rendered page is just static HTML and CSS, like no JavaScript event listeners or anything ready at that point, 
um, what happens if the user interacts with the page. So you may say, like, if they start typing in an input, what, what will be the effect of that? Uh, well, there are a couple ways you can account for uh, users interacting with your pre-rendered page. One is you can just not render interactive components, which is actually my preferred strategy in most cases. Or you could record and replay user events. Um, so this is actually a pretty good example of, of progressive rendering of a page that Google Docs does, where they render the page, and they've got interactive elements there, but they're, they're disabled for now until the page is actually fully bootstrapped and ready to interact. So me as a user, it's a visual cue to me that, OK, I see that I will be able to do these things, uh, but I'm, it's obvious that I can't yet do it. And then when I'm able to, I can. So that's one way you can get around it. But there's another option. Uh, Jeff Welpley, sitting in the front row here, Jeff, has created a library, uh, along with some other contributors, called PreBootJS. Now what this will do, it'll record most user events on your pre-rendered pages, like interaction with forms and, and other events on the page. And then once the page is bootstrapped in the browser with Angular, it will replay those events to try to get the UI to the same state that it, it was beforehand. So the user can start interacting sooner and then have a seamless transition uh, after the fact. Uh, there, there are some gotchas with that, like since there aren't validators and other, other side effects that could be applied to the pre-rendered page, it's possible the user could do things that uh, aren't allowed by the Angular application, and so they might see some, some things happen uh, when it takes over. And so it's important to be conscious of how you use it and uh, use it in as few cases as, as you need to where you can really deliver a better experience with it. Um, so those are the, that's basically how pre-rendering works. And so if any of these things are important to your application, which I don't know too many applications that don't value these things, then it, it's worth considering pre-rendering, at least for part of the application. So to get started on that path, uh, the main point of this talk is to talk about some strategies or how to think about pre-rendering strategies that make sense for your application. In general, with pre-rendering, our goal is to deliver meaningful content to the user as quickly as possible uh, while not significantly impacting the time to interactive. So we want users to see things, but we also don't want to delay the time to interactive for where they can actually use the app too much. So there are a lot of factors that go into how you think about your strategy. One is how many pages do you have? How fresh must your content be to be useful? Uh, how often am I deploying my application? How much computation cost and availability do I have? How, how many like, just machines or jobs can I delegate to to do pre-rendering? Uh, what are the developer ergonomics? Like, how much work is it for me as a developer to write my application in a way that can be pre-rendered? How often is each page visited? Like, there are certain pages of your, often, your site that are directly visited more often than others. Like, I don't typically link directly into my shopping cart page on Amazon. I usually go to Amazon.com or I go to a product page if it's shared somewhere. Not too many people are sharing links to a shopping cart. And uh, your overall impact on time to interactive is an important thing, because as we make that first step of the process faster, we want to not uh, have a, a heavy cost on how long it takes for the app to become fully interactive, especially a uh, concern if you're doing the pre-rendering at runtime as the request is being performed. Obviously, you're doing a little bit of computation on the server. That's going to take a little bit of time, so you want to make sure that's not uh, delaying the time to interactive significantly. So I've broken the anatomy of a strategy into three categories. Uh, each strategy has a content strategy, a time strategy, and a user-specific strategy. Uh, let's look at what the content strategy is. Basically, this is what should be rendered on a route. Uh, there are some options here. You could just render a shell. So you could have a global app shell for every page of your application that just has a header and footer, and that's all you show. And that's the easiest thing to do. Or you could just render the critical content of a page. So if it's an article, you could just render the article, but ignore all the other components and widgets on your page, um, which is, is good for search engines and some other use cases. And then the last kind of extreme use case is we could render everything on the page, including session-specific data for that user at that moment. So when we think about what should be rendered, here's kind of a, a scale. At the app shell, you've got something minimal. And then on the middle, you've got critical content where you've got interactive elements that are disabled, but they're there so that when the page bootstraps, it's not a big uh, jar or jarring uh, transition to go to that. It's kind of fluid. Um, and at the end of the spectrum, we have it where we have full session data and uh, everything for that user that looks pretty much how it will look after Angular's done bootstrapping. 
This is a spectrum of generic on one end to specific on the other end, where generic fits everybody in every context, specific is specific to this user uh, in this moment. So if we, have, if we flip that spectrum and we say simplest at the top, rendering the entire screen is simpler because you don't have to think too much about what you're rendering, you just say render the whole thing. And at the bottom, we've got rendering partial screen, which is less computation. Uh, so if you're doing that at runtime, then the, you know, the less work you have to do, the better. And some example of where pages in real life would fall on the spectrum are like a bank statement. You probably want it to be re-rendered each time because you want the exact moment of your account balance. You don't want to see yesterday's account balance. Um, blog posts are things that you know maybe maybe a, uh, they get updated with comments or or edits and things that you want to re-render on the fly. And at the bottom, we've got like a settings page deep in my application that. Uh, I probably don't even need to pre-render it. I can just serve an app shell and let Angular pre-render it on the front end because it's not a frequently visited page and certainly not a deep linked page. And then we have the time component of our strategy. So if we take our same graph and we add another access to it, we've got uh, when a page is rendered. So on one extreme, we've got build time. So as I'm building my application, either in my CI process or locally, I can actually decide to pre-render pages that I want to at that point. Uh, or at the other end, I can do it for each request that comes in. I can render the page then. And both have different trade-offs. So at request time, obviously, you're doing work in the critical path of serving a request, which makes it hard to uh, deliver uh, quickly. And then in between, you've got some, some in-betweens. Like you can have lazy request rendering where after the first time a page has been requested, you can cache it. So next time it's requested, you can return the cached version. And aside from that, you could have a parallel process that could be a batch or a cron job that is uh, rendering pages uh, as your site's being served, and then you can check from your, if that's been pre-rendered from that cache uh, when you are serving, but it doesn't have to render everything. So we've got the best runtime performance on the left end of the spectrum because there's less work to be done by the server at request time. But on the right hand side, we have the most dynamic. So the, it, it's a little bit easier because it's fully dynamic and I don't have to do much thinking about optimizing it. So plotting kind of the same applications on this graph, the uh, bank statement is the request time because you always want the, the most recent uh, info. But like an app shell would be the bottom left because it's only part of the screen and you can do it at build time and you should do it at build time. Whereas product pages, news articles, you know, those are things that are, have somewhat of a time component to them and uh, may have some, some updates or edits that you want to grab. And the last aspect is the user. So different users will have different needs of what they need to be shown, and some of it is relevant for what should be pre-rendered. Uh, like a search engine is one of your users, for example. Uh, for them, you probably want to render just the critical content, and you probably want to render it often uh, so that it's fresh. And then we have logged in users. So for them, there's probably more interactive elements or more user-specific things on the page. Uh, a lot of times it's not necessary for that to be pre-rendered. Like if I'm looking at a product page, it's not critical for me to see how many items are in my cart or other things that might be on the page. I, I could have placeholder UI for those. And we have an anonymous user who we could probably just render a, a pre-cached anonymous page for every anonymous user that visits the page. And international users, we want to render the correct locale for them. Even if we have an app shell, we want to have an app shell with the correct locale. So that's kind of how strategies work. I want to talk about a couple of example use cases of how you would consider the right way to mix up strategies for different routes in your application. So if we considered an e-commerce product detail page, it's got 100,000 products, 10 locales, and it's got this dynamic widget on it that shows my cart and how much money I have in my cart and it offers to let me pay for my cart. And we do daily deploys of this. So if we have that, you know, these characteristics, that means it would be 10 billion pages to build each day, assuming we did it at build time and we're building every single product. And that's a lot to generate in a build step. I don't know how many data centers or computers you can throw at it. It's still a lot uh, to be generating every day and a lot of expense and a lot of time. So what if instead we said, okay, we don't need to render the shopping cart data. We can just replace that with an element that uh, is inactive. And we just generated pages for all products for all locales. So then that would take it down pretty significantly to where we just have a million pages to build daily. But that's still a lot to generate, and it's likely that only some of those product pages will be accessed every day. You know, some products are more popular than others. So what the optimal strategy in this case would be, the content, we could just render the product details when requesting the product de detail page and render placeholder components for the user-specific content, like the shopping cart. 
in the time, we could, we could render it request time, and then we could have a pass-through cache so that after it's been requested, I cache it, and then next time a user requests this page, it's already cached. And there are, there are other ways you could do it. This is just one example. So you could actually get more complex and say that we know what the most popular products are, so when we build it, we'll kick off a process to start rendering all the most popular product pages so they'll be cached and ready to serve. And then for the user, we'll just render the product page for their locale, and that's as far as we'll go with rendering anything user-specific so that we can share that rendered page for all of the users at this locale. So let's look at another example. We've got a shopping cart page as part of our shopping cart. This isn't a pretty uh, in a common entry point for the site. Most people you know, buy stuff and then end up at the shopping cart when they're ready to check out. I don't share this link on Facebook. Uh, and it's not indexed by search engines, because why would it be? And uh, the content changes pretty often as the user uses the app or products change. So the optimal strategy in this case is for the content, all we should render is the app shell. I mean, we could render the full card if we wanted to at request time, but probably not a whole lot of value there because, like I said, users aren't directly landing at this page, so they've already got the application warmed up at the time that they land at the shopping cart page. And for time, we could just render the app shell at build time. So there's no sense doing it on a server. It's quick to do at build time to pre-render the app shell. And we'll have a cart-specific app shell in this case. And for the user, we just want to have the right locale for them. So we would have, if we support 10 locales, we would just have 10 cart app shells, and we would select the right one to serve to them. So uh, to conclude, application could have a single strategy for the whole application or mix and match different strategies for different routes and different users. Uh, the appropriate strategy may depend on the user, may not. Uh, rendering can occur at any time, build time, request time, in parallel. It's, it's really flexible enough to you how to manage it. And the content of the page is the biggest factor in determining what's the right strategy, what's going to deliver the best user experience. Uh, so that's a little bit of a high level, like how to think about strategy, how to think about integrating uh, pre-rendering into your application. If you want to get started, uh, the, right now there's a great GitHub wiki that uh, talks about how to use Angular CLI with Universal. Uh, by the time people walk, watch this talk, there may be other docs that are better than this, so your best bet is just to Google Angular CLI Universal. And right now you'll end up at the wiki page, but later, who knows? Uh, maybe I'll write a blog article and optimize it for that search term and then uh, get all the traffic. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, check it out. They've got, it's a really well done story. It's, uh, I've seen a lot of people go through it without problems. I've done it myself. So uh, check it out. Uh, get started and you'll see how, uh, I think it's pretty easy. You'll see how, how much easier it's gotten in the last uh, year. So thank you. I'll tweet these slides. Uh, if you follow me at Jeff B. Cross and uh, if you've got any questions, you know, grab me or, uh, or whatever or just send me an email. I'm happy to chat. Thank you.